<laughs> all right, guys. Uh, we all saw Captain Marvel. Uh, we know EJ's uh, e- e- EJ's uh, reaction to it because he put the YouTube video up uh, of the review. He did the review for Flickering Myth. I didn't have to shamelessly self-promote myself. Oh, that was so nice. <laughs> I tried to shout you out. I shouted you out last week. Uh, uh, I shouted out your personal channel about your Oscar reactions. Oh, well, thank you. You're um, welcome. Yeah. You would have known you know if you hard... listened to the episode. Gosh, <laughs> I, I, well, sorry for shooting me there. <laughs> I say for me, it's so hard. I saw Captain Marvel weeks ago, so it's been so hard for me to just not talk about this movie. Um, it has been very difficult to not just be like, there's just things we need to talk about and moments, and I'm interested in everyone's reaction. I don't want to say uh, just because, but Tori, you're not the comic book person. But you are a woman. I need to know your feelings. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, you probably won't be surprised to know that this is not my first appearance this weekend on a podcast as Token Woman to talk about Captain Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> I get because every, no, every... no film site wants to be that site where they don't have a woman in the discussion. <laughs> and whether or not I will bring anything particularly valid to the conversation, but hopefully I will. Um. From, let's go from my mainly non-comic book uh, opinion mm-hmm. in that obviously I actually no no I was gonna that would have been totally wrong no I had no understanding of Captain Marvel before seeing the film I did not know Captain Marvel existed until they announced it what was a couple of years ago they announced Brie Larson being cast so I went into the film with no backstory, no knowledge. The only thing I vaguely knew was that apparently there's some argument over who the real Captain Marvel is. Shazam comes into it, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. <laughs> that's that's a, um, summed it up right there. Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay, great. Um, as a film, it was, it was good. It was by no means perfect, but I was, I was entertained. And kind of when, when I'm considering this, similar to the way I thought about it when I was watching Wonder Woman. It's not like I go into the cinema beforehand and I'm like, yeah, okay, this film has to be all about it being a female superhero and I want every moment to reference that and I want to feel so included because (laughs) all this time I felt so excluded. I mean, no, because it's not like I go into the other Marvel and DC Universe films and feel excluded, you know? I mean... I really enjoyed both the first and third Avengers films. I really liked a Thor Ragnarok and none, none of them have female protagonists. I don't feel excluded by that. So in a way, Captain Marvel being a woman was kind of secondary, really, to the film for me. And actually one of the issues I did slightly have with it, and this is no knocking Brie Larson, who I think is a fantastic actress, but I actually struggled a bit with the personality of Captain Marvel, I feel like it was slightly skipped over or maybe consumed by the fact that obviously throughout the film, she is trying to figure out her identity and where she's from. So in that way, it wasn't such kind of as a hardcore feminist superhero thing for me. Mm. Yeah, I don't think I usually I felt the same way about Wonder Woman not being a quote unquote feminist film. I don't really I didn't expect it to be. I mean, there was great lines of like, you know, I, one, I learned that I didn't know women weren't allowed to fight in combat like in the oh, 90s, yeah. let alone up until I think it was the first um, or the newer Iraq war. God, there's so many Iraq wars. Yay. Um, <laughs> I, I just yeah, in, I was in, in the UK. Combat positions have only been opened up to women this year so wow that's oh oh man yep. i'm even a little bit more sadder now um but yeah that that was something interesting to me so those those were those feminine mo- feminist moments i looked forward for and i was like awesome but yeah i i agree with you i felt the same way with bohemian rhapsody i didn't need him to say i'm gay every scene or i'm bisexual every <laughs> scene that's not yeah. how we work <laughs> Um, same thing with Captain Marvel. I didn't need her to be like, hi, I'm a woman. How are you today? Or hi, I'm the woman here. Yeah, I'm fine with that. So I liked, you know, that they didn't push it that hard. Mm-hmm. I think if they pushed it, they actually end up alienating people anyway. Yes, as Brie Larson's own personal comments have, which 
we, if we ever want to get into those, oh. I have feelings and we'll comments on those guys, as well. Let's, let's not forget, yeah, my opinion's valid, isn't it? But I'm not sure about you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, everything else, like for women, everything like us three have said has been muted and they only hear you. It's amazing how that works. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, I didn't, for all the, um, all the shit this has gotten for being a heavy handed feminist film from people that haven't fucking seen the movie. <laughs> How it's, can you describe it as that? It's I, not. I literally just said the opposite. Yeah, yeah, it is like so not. Like, I mean, there's moments where, like, where it's like, yeah, girl that power, or whatever. Line, but, like, yeah, that one cockpit line where they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. it's called a cockpit. I was like, oh, you get it because we have different genitalia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, like, that a, was a, yeah. And I guess the, the other line was the uh, scanning Nick Fury and it being, was it what, human male threat level, like low to non existent? I, mean, I will say, Fury, I, did slight, I did slightly enjoy that one. But yeah. you, you, but those are kind of the only two lines that we can think of, right? Off yeah. the top of, top and of it, my head. And it isn't even like it was like human male threat level low, human female threat level high. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. It was it, your lies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, like, like the few like you know we're we're powerful women moments were just felt like i mean they were inserted in there and they were mostly natural. Like it wasn't just like yeah. hey, hey, and hey. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I guess some of the like we, powerful woman moments were, were kind of just powerful superhero moments. Mm -hmm. yes. So, you know, when she's zipping around outer space, for want of a better word, yeah. like the globe and everything, and it's all very retro 80s, 90s kitsch, and I was really enjoying that. That, well, it's a powerful woman moment, but it's also just a I'm a superhero moment. Yeah. Yes, because I loved when she. I was. I love when she said, "I've been fighting with one hand behind my back." That's a line for any superhero. I love when a Superman would say that. With anyone would say that. I'm like, yes, fight yeah. with both hands now. So I agree with you. I like that it was, you know, in that way that it just felt like powerful moments, not powerful mm -hmm. add in your minority moments. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think people. I mean, there's a large contingent of people that are just like, she's not the first Captain Marvel. Why is she going to be the first Captain Marvel here? It's like, because she's been Captain Marvel in the comics for, I don't know, 20, 30 years. I don't, maybe not that long. Maybe Because I'll be honest with you. I don't know much about Captain Marvel. I've, yeah, it's probably because they killed off Marvel in the, in the, um, in the eighties. Mm -hmm. And then. She wasn't even the second Captain well, Marvel. Well, they though. killed off Captain Marvel in the 90s. The reason our generation doesn't know her as opposed to a Wonder Woman or anyone else is the rogue superhero mm -hmm. from X-Men Rogue mm -hmm. stole all of her powers. That's why Rogue can fly and has super strength. Yeah. She stole all of Captain Marvel's powers. So in our generation, there is no Captain Marvel. So that's why we're oh. like, who is she? It's because she was already, by the comic books, sucked up into someone else's superpowers. No, she's so been she, in, I mean, she's been in print uh, as Carol Danvers for a while. Was well, that? I, I, well, I, mean, I This is that, a blank like, spot just, for me. I would say in that early time, I remember, because I always go off X-Men being yeah. such a big Marvel thing for us growing up, the animated series, mm -hmm. and she was never featured. She was never in the Spider-Man animated stuff. So she was so comic book lore, not a mainstream one, which was so crazy that... She did kind of pop out of nowhere. Yeah, I mean, Wasp was no more popular than she was. That's true. But I, people, like, if people were like, "Well, they should, they should have Marvel as, as the first, uh, as the first Captain, uh, Captain Marvel." Like, I've read like the Captain, like the Captain Marvel when it's Marvel, it was mm -hmm. a man originally. Starts off as Roy Thomas, as a Roy Thomas comic, which is boring because Roy Thomas is boring and then it becomes a jim starlin comic where he in, gets into the stuff with uh thanos and and more of that lore and marvell as captain marvel is a cipher like he is has no personality he's not there for any reason other than to be like a core character that facilitates things that go on around him he's not interesting so this was a more interesting choice especially when you've got a lineup where you've never put a woman in the lead. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, maybe there was a little bit of politics there, but who cares? Like, you didn't miss out on anything. Um, I mean, it's just, I just as bad. A, a, a little, a brief sidebar up and ask, just because you mentioned, obviously, 
first time Marvel's putting a woman in the lead. Mm -hmm. Is anything happening with the Black Widow yes. solo movie? Apparently they cast somebody else in that uh, recently, and that's actually moving forward, which is like... Mm -hmm. A day late and a dollar short, but yeah. you, you <laughs> yeah, really should Like, nobody cares anymore. <laughs> I will say, and I don't blame them. Scarlett Johansson can barely sell her own movies. I don't mind her. She's fine, but she can barely front her own films. They're going to need to give her another big name, and I'm not talking Hawkeye in Budapest or whatever they want to do. Like, they're going to need to give her something big, and I don't... And I like her, but also the Black Widow movie came out last year. It was called Red Sparrow, and no one liked it. <laughs> yeah. Look, I mean, I agree with you that you should never put a movie on the shoulders of Scarlett Johansson, but, like, there's been a good long stretch where, like, Marvel were the only people that felt that way. <laughs> like, the yeah. people would cast her in thing after thing after thing and put her in the lead, and Marvel had every opportunity to do it, and they just didn't, so. Um, yeah. Um, but as far as this movie goes, like the fact that any, any nerd that's acting like this is a bad movie because Brie Larson said some, said she would like to talk to more than just white men <laughs> on the press, on the, uh, on our press tours, um, is ridiculous. This movie has like, I've, I've heard it accused of fan service for like MCU stuff, and I think there's a little bit in the, of that in there, but there's like. So some... it's an MCU movie then? Yeah, no. Yeah, like, like, constantly. It's Marvel patting themselves on the back? Gas. Yeah. They do that every movie. But there's so much like deep comics lore in this, too, where like, this is the Kree Scroll War. I mean, for all I give Roy Thomas shit for being boring, like, that, his Avengers run with the Kree Scroll War isn't uh so so that's cool uh this reference is project pegasus which is a deep deep cut from like marvel 2 and one starring the thing where like they take the cosmic cube after they defeat thanos for experimentation and that's like a long uh there's a i don't know not long it's a seven or eight issue uh storyline with the thing uh, so, like, there's just a lot of deep Marvel comics lore that I thought they would never touch on. Like, I like that Project Pegasus shit, but it's random shit from, like, the late 70s that no one gives a fuck about. So I didn't expect to, uh, to see it come up here. Um, I don't know. It's great. I like Jude Law. M movies where I like Jude Law are just, like, so few and far between. <laughs> so, so it's nice. Like, I, I don't... Like, I, I, I like to like Jude Law, but I just don't often do it, you know? Can I do, say my... do you not just think he he plays himself, though? I mean... I'm, oh, yeah, absolutely. That's why... That's the problem. <laughs> actor, many an actor makes their career off that. Samuel L. Jackson will come to you in a moment. Mm -hmm. But, like, with Jude Law, I was... I, I didn't actually... I don't think I was aware he was going to be in a film. And then he turns up, and he kind of always plays the same... Slightly obnoxious, but thinks he's charming, cocky guy. Um, but one guy of the issues I had with him mainly was that I don't really think they gave his character much substance, much kind of backstory and, and motivation. I mean, I know the basic motivation, which is revealed towards the end of the film, but it didn't really make much sense. You were kind of plonked in the middle of, oh, and here, here, here he is. And I wasn't really sure why he was there. Oh, because the career are shits. <laughs> so I mean, I guess I have uh, have like I think this worked for me on a lot of levels for for having a comic book background, and I try not to bring that in with me uh, when try, when looking at a movie. But I mean, it's just there. Um, no, but please do in this instance if it you know helps out because maybe, maybe this is when me not knowing the comic books means I'm missing out on the thing. Specifically, I don't know his character. I don't know if his character is directly from a comic book, but the way they position Cree politics in here, which I was really, uh, I was worried that they were going to just be like, scrolls bad, Cree good. I mean, they made the scrolls look like they're, uh, they're better and more worth, worth caring about than they are. Uh, yeah. I think they were a little bit too worthy potentially. Yeah. Uh, but like, I was, I was worried that they're going to be like, oh, you know, the Crees are, are good guys. Cause they, in that trailer, they're like, yeah, we're a, we're a race of noble uh, warrior heroes or yeah. whatever. It's like, Ah oh, man, the career shit. So I hope that's not how we're playing this. So uh, 
so yeah, him being just a just a uh, a foot soldier in like this this genocide of of scrolls is a completely reasonable motivation to me. Um, yeah, I mean Jude Law is always Jude Law. That, that's why I say I like it when a movie makes me like him, <laughs> as opposed to like Jude Law doing anything different uh, to make me like him to make me like him himself. Can we just officially call him the White Will Smith? I think that's I mean, unfair to Will always, Smith. That's yeah, fair. I don't... <laughs> I've seen Will Smith be a lot more varied than, than Jude Law. <laughs> I have hated Jude Law since my biology teacher made me watch Gattaca. And like... <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, Can we all have a moment to shout out Ben Bendelson for eating yes! that up? Yeah, because Ben Mendelsohn knew what movie he was in. He knew what movie I wanted him to be in. I, I mean, he. And I don't know if we're gonna if we talk about him. It does get kind of spoilery because his character is ed, of an interesting nature in this movie. But I had so much fun with him. I enjoyed yeah. him so much. The swerve. I love, no, I love, I love, love Ben Mendelsohn so much. So again, I went into the film not really knowing who was in it. I actually recognized him in his first guise before you would recognize him physically. That makes I recognized him from his voice. The Australian accent happened and I thought, is that Ben Mendelssohn? <laughs> I, I was so pleased when it was because I think he's an incredible actor. And even when mm. they, they, they give him a character seemingly of one dimension, generally being Ben Mendelssohn, it's evil. Yes. He just he just does it. He nails it. As you said, EJ, like he knows he knows what films he's in. He's like, right, cool, I'll turn up, I'll deliver, you'll enjoy it. I'll the, go home. Yeah, the, the biggest swerve of this movie is like, hey, Ben Mendelssohn isn't the villain. <laughs> <laughs> like, um I I didn't know he was in this movie when I went into it. But honestly my favorite moment with him is when he is, uh, when he is, uh, and this isn't much of a spoiler, but we'll, we'll be spoiling things a little bit. We're gonna try not to, to hardcore spoil it. But when it's revealed that he is a scroll, once Fury realizes that he's a scroll, he drops the American accent and then just drops into an Australian accent, like because. That's just what scrolls sound like. They yeah. sound like Australians. <laughs> no, yeah, that's what made me laugh. Like right at the beginning, when I was recognizing him from that accent, I was saying, "Oh, that's Ben Mendelsohn." I was like, "Oh, okay." So we're all scrolls Australian then. And it just seemed like a bit of a weird decision. But then I guess yeah, it made Ben Mendelsohn's life easier, and I guess it was also a very simplistic way of being like, "This is for when Ben Mendelsohn's doing this part of the character. He's American." <laughs> And when he's doing this part of the character, he's Australian. But yeah, it was slightly weird. Yeah, I, I like him and I was excited to, to see him in here. I've liked him in, you know, I mean, for all I don't Everything. really like Dark Knight Rises, I like him in there, uh, the, the weird character he plays. I liked him in uh, Rogue One, of course. I like him in Slow West with Michael Fassbender. Um, I still need to see that, oh, but that now is... I know Ben Mendelsohn's in it. Top of the list. <laughs> yes, that one is great. Uh, the the title is not ironic, so um, be awake and caffeinated. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I I liked more than most people. I think the the handling of Nick Fury in this movie. Uh, we won't spoil it, but they do uh, they do reveal how he loses his eye, and most people hate it. I don't. <laughs> I like it. I was waiting for it to be a tad bit more dramatic. Same situation to kind of, we won't, we won't spoil it, but I was waiting for it to be like, oh, that one thing that we had saw before, that was going to get the eye, not just a normal one. I was like, okay, whatever. But it was fine. I didn't hate him. Again, I like Nick Fury when, or at least Samuel Jackson, when I don't have to always think that he's a badass. <laughs> I get it. I get it. You're awesome, Samuel Jackson. I've loved you since... Pulp Fiction, I get it. But, like, this, I was like, oh, he's kind of, like, a cute soft boy, Nick Fury. And, like, I kind of <laughs> want to, like, I want to cuddle with him now as opposed to, like, he's just badass. I don't know. I liked this feel of him, and I got a whole different vibe. And I think this is, this adds a layer to his character other than just, oh, cool Nick Fury with the eye patch. Now I'm like, oh, but he was also friends with the Goose, and he's cool <laughs> with Talos. And that little dinner scene at the end with that was such an odd scene of, like, aliens and humans. It was really cute. Yeah. 
Yeah, I loved I loved him in the film, but I will say the whole Kitty obsession was maybe taking it slightly too far. Although I agree with you, Jay, it made him kind of cute and cuddly. I was also a bit like, but would Nick Fury love a cat so much? I don't. I, I mean, now, like, why not? I don't think he would now. I think he kind of <laughs> joked about it He's in another. He's bitter and twisted now, and this is him in his shiny pre-ruined days. Yes, because he does the joke about one of the other Marvel movies of like, oh, you know, I whoever like I lost my eye with, I just learned not to trust again. And I'm like, I think he kind of took that whole mentality seriously. I think in general, I think. This was a, yeah, like you said, a baby Nick Fury. He wasn't hard. He only had seen one alien invasion, not all the other ones he's had to deal with. So, yeah, I think I, I liked him in this. I, I can see where people would complain because he is supposed to be this badass Sam Jackson character. But mm. Sam Jackson's like a 70-year-old man. Like, I'm done with <laughs> yeah. him always having to and, be, like, king badass. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I did kind of enjoy the fact that you were meeting Nick Fury before he technically met an alien and knew it. Yeah. yeah, I thought that was that was really fun. Yeah, I thought it was a good time. Um, I liked that. I really, from the trailers, expected this movie to like bang me over the head with '90s shit, and like right up front, you get the blockbuster and the Radio Shack joke, and then after that, it's kind of it's the mu the musical choices mm -hmm. are all uh, clearly influenced oh, by that. But some of the there fashion is choices. one musical choice that was bad. Oh, that last one with that No Doubt song. I was oh, just like, no. No. but why? <laughs> but why? This... But why not, EJ? I'm okay. sorry, I have to disagree. That is never not appropriate to have some Gwen Stefani in a soundtrack. Let me, it let might me just, have been jarring, but I liked it. Let me fix it for you. If she would have kicked over a radio or hit a jukebox <laughs> and it would have motivated, I would have been like, oh, cool, fine or something, but I was just like, oh, and now Gwen Stefani's yelling at me. Yay. What was the like, song? Oh, just I'm, a Girl. Just a girl. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, what, that's what I thought. No, I like that. I'm, I'm okay with that. I, I uh, liked it. It was just like a, oh, that's a song we're playing. I, I mean, I also got to hear Celebrity Skin by Hole. So again, mm. I was I was getting my 90s like grungy girl fix. See, EJ, here, I, here's I, the I, thing. The moment you said you had one problem with one of the music choices, my eyes got wide because I thought you were about to agree with me here. And that's the fact that I hated that, like, throughout this entire soundtrack, you had badass 90s chicks. And so they're like, oh, and here's the uh, mandatory Nirvana song. <laughs> I'm like, oh, fuck you. Uh, you, ruined, yeah. you ruined the theme. Because they had Hole. They had Garbage. They had TLC. And then it's like, oh, and here's Kurt Cobain. Honestly. That is true. You know, I, I agree with that, actually. I Also, it's not timeline-wise. Hasn't that Nirvana song been proven to be a bit of a weird choice because it become it's in the years that she technically wasn't on Earth? Yeah, yeah like I mean, she yeah, wouldn't have really. 90s. 90s. Yeah, she would have been gone by it the was time it was coming to war, wasn't it? Yeah. Was it was that off of a? Uh, was that off of Nevermind or was that off in Utero? I, I'm not a Nirvana expert. I'm not either. I, uh, I wouldn't know. All I know is that someone raised on the internet that it was released in the early 90s and she was yeah, known it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure so she, she was subconscious? taken from Earth at 89, in 89. So like, Yeah, and then came back in 95. Yeah, so for it to be playing in her subconscious was weird. But honestly, like, I loathe Nirvana. <laughs> like, I really <laughs> don't like Nirvana at all. And Fair I enough. was okay with it. So, so like, I was like, all right, they put... They put Nirvana in here, and I'm not hating it right now. That's wild. <laughs> you could have just put Spice Girls in place, and it would have been I mean, better. Maybe not that particular <laughs> scene. I don't know. I I feel like maybe Spice Girls would have been a, a song that would have any of their songs that would have slightly brought me out of the film, and I'd have been like, really? No, no, no. they could have used it any other place in the movie. Don't ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I was an original Spice Girls fan, but I don't actually. There would have been no Spice Girls because they had not released their first song in 1995. Look at you coming in, out gaying me. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Come As You Are um, was um, off of Nevermind, which came out in 1992. Hmm. Which, I mean, it's fine. Well, the album came out in 91. It's, it was released as a single in that, uh, early 92. So. It's fine. It doesn't fine. matter where it came from. No. It's just I hated the fact that they ruined their like badass chick music theme <laughs> with fucking Kurt Cobain. <laughs>
I don't know. I enjoyed the movie a lot. It's in my upper tier of Marvel movies. Um, it's in the top 25%. <laughs> top 25%? Yeah, I okay. yeah. I thought you were going to say top 25. I was like, that's... Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely in the top 25. <laughs> um, I yeah, I, I'd say it's in my the upper quarter of... Uh, Maybe uh, upper third. At least upper third yeah. of, of Marvel movies for me. It didn't like blow my mind, but it had enough there for me as a comics fan. And I think... I enjoy um, just. And Gerald pointed this out. Pointed this out. He was like, "I know why you liked it because it's just a superhero being a superhero, <laughs> and we don't get enough of that." And that's true. I like somebody just being a good guy and just being a superhero. Like, I, I enjoy deconstructions of superheroes and whatnot to an extent, but like this constant need to just adult superheroes up and make it seem like they're psychologically deep i don't give a fuck about and i hate it (laughs) so so to just be a superhero movie where she just does good because she's a good person i liked it Mm. yeah it's quite it was uncomplicated but that's not necessarily a bad thing yeah i mean superheroes were i mean they they were made to be the least complicated thing in the world. <laughs> they're just they're just people that, that that have powers and they want to do good, so they put on tights and and fight gangsters and supervillains or whatever. Like it's not like I again I respect a lot of writing that's been done on deconstruction. I like that a lot of things have that they've been kept up with and and all psychologically analyzed can be fun every now and then or whatnot whatnot. But like that we constantly feel like that's what we have to do with a superhero or it's not a it's not a good superhero. It's not a story worth telling is bullshit. <sighs> I have a lot of feelings about that. <laughs> um EJ, you said you had a lot of thoughts about the uh, the reaction, uh, the, the 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 review bombing on Rotten Tomatoes, and all of this like this really premature reaction, this this predisposition to hate it from a certain sect of the internet. Yeah, I, it was confusing. I don't know. I was sorry. I was just looking at my notes and was like, ha, huh, I really wanted um, Carol Danvers and Maria to be gay lovers, and they weren't. That was still <laughs> upsetting to me. Every time they said, we've been really good friends for a long time, I rolled my eyes, and I was like, yeah, I've used that excuse in college. Um, I will say, when, when they were looking through all like the, the photos with her daughter, and it was like all of them together, and I was just like, is there? Am I imagining? Could there have been? I, oh, I don't I think w- it's- I I got it. I loved it. It's the same way I feel about Bucky and Steve. Like, they're <sighs> gay boyfriends, and I'm fine with them, and these two are good for each other as well. I'm happy with all of it. But no, um, the review bombing, I don't know. I just, I would rather talk about nicer things because it was <laughs> so dumb. Look, I go to press screenings. I have been to them since 2016, almost late, 2000, late 2015. I am the only person under the age of 40 I am one of the only people of color, and there is one other woman in there. What she said is not wrong. People have a point. She has a point. She could have said it better. She didn't have to be all sassy with it, Mm. because she was a little, like, kind of combative, and I think that's what scared people off. Her comment about Wrinkle in Time of, I don't care what a 40-year-old man has to say about a movie for little girls. (laughs) Once again, it, it was ballsy. It, I got, she has a point as well. I don't know. I thought it was dumb. I love that it didn't work. The movie made a, half a billion dollars this weekend. So obviously none of it worked. You can try to bomb something on Rotten Tomatoes, but honestly, and as someone who is on Rotten Tomatoes, it doesn't really matter. It's a, it is a small microcosm of the world of film. Who cares? Like, I'm so glad yeah. they fixed it so they didn't have it to be as dramatic as it was because you're going to see that with the next Star Wars movie. It's going to happen again. Um, mm. it, it It's not going to go away, but if we can start curving this, like, I don't know. I, I'm glad fans are vocal and they aren't just accepting what studios are giving them because that's entertainment. We have a voice. You can say it. There's a way of saying it, and there's a way of not sounding like a trolling douchebag. Just because Brie Larson's a woman doesn't mean this movie's bad. And the, the constant... Yeah, and also the point you were making as well is that of these, because wasn't something like 50,000 reviews, most of these people, probably, I assume, you know, one person doing multiple reviews anyway, won't even have seen the film. So kind of douchebagginess even aside, motive for review even aside, don't 
publish your opinion if you've not seen the film. Uh -oh. Nothing will invalidate your opinion more in anyone's eyes, including Brie Larson's, than if you haven't seen the fucking film. Tori, what's even better is there is so as many reviews for Captain Marvel in one day than Infinity War yeah. the entire run. <laughs> yeah, I read that. They and that, I mean, and that, that is properly. just crazy. <laughs> yeah. And... And I, I am also going to be here and back up Brie Larson's comment just briefly because, yeah, what she said did not go down well, but I think it's perfectly valid to say that certain films, particularly with The Wrinkle in Time, they have audiences and doesn't mean that anyone's op opinion is invalid if you've seen the film. Mm. Everyone's opinion is valid. But when a film is specifically made for a demographic, it would be nice if that demographic's opinions were amplified and magnified now i feel like with captain marvel it's a bit different because obviously yeah there's a woman in the lead so maybe we'll encourage more women into cinema to see a superhero film who may not have seen it but that is kind of assuming falsely that women don't go and see superhero films anyway and don't enjoy them and not necessarily have a problem with them yeah but it is true and i you know i would have loved to have been you know, gone to one of Brie Larson's press interviews for this film, that would have been awesome because she probably is right. And she probably was only talking to men over 40 because that's what I experience. I'm going to a press junket on Tuesday and I will report back to you with exactly how many men there were and how old <laughs> they were because I'm always like 20 years younger than anybody else there. I went to a screening a few years ago where I was the only person without a walking stick. <laughs> oh, wow. And I was the only female. And I it was actually in the screening, which was for uh, that Phantom Thread, actually. It was well, that screening surprising. where I sat down and thought, oh my God, it's true. Like, I know there are more men than review films than women, but this is insane. <laughs> and I was actually thinking, like, oh my God, if, if someone came in this in this screening and like took a picture, they'd be like, this is all that's wrong with with film criticism today. But actually, it was because it was like 11 a.m. on a Tuesday and most people were at work. <laughs> real quick to what Tori says, I will say I like that you say there is certain movies made for certain people. Nothing against you, but I wouldn't trust your opinion on a horror film. That's not your thing. You don't have a background with it. As opposed to me, I love slashers. I love all this. You would go to me and be like, OK, this is a horror movie. What do you think? As opposed to what you know the guys were doing with us and Oscar films. They're like, look, this isn't our forte. And I think that's what some critics and people in this industry need to admit. Not everything is not for everyone. Sometimes yeah, we all have yeah. fortes. Sometimes there's things that like I would much rather go to Alan or Gerald for a comic book opinion than I would me that I like them casually. You know what I mean? I think that's something in this industry we also need to admit that not yeah. everything is for everyone. Yes, like Captain Marvel is a big superhero film that is a big, mass marketed thing. But also, there's just things that's going to be for its fans. Like, yeah. I, no, it's I, an interesting I, debate. I, I like that. Yeah, I couldn't, but I couldn't agree with you more. I feel like, if anything, one of the easiest things to help with this whole situation, and I try and do this in a lot of my reviews, is just kind of remember when you're reviewing a film, it is your opinion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what you get out of the film and why you saw the film and your background in that genre are all going to feed into that. So like I will see a film sometimes and I will be like, I don't, I don't really like this personally. But when I'm reviewing it, I try to be as neutral as possible. And if I'm going to upmarket or downmarket or say something, I will always try and give a reason for why I'm doing that and then say, you know, essentially something along the line of, this is just my opinion. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm not saying this is how, you know, this is a two out of five, the end. No, it might be a two out of five for me, and I can 100% see it being a four out of five for everybody else. Mm -hmm. I feel like people have lost the thread of what film criticism is. Film criticism yeah. is, it's not a monolith. You should find film critics that line up with your opinions especially like, okay, this film critic kind of feels the same way I do about this type of movie. Mm. So I'm going to see what they thought about it. Like Rotten Tomatoes is like, I like the idea of a review aggregator for the most part, but whenever it's not the final word on things. No. Um, and, you know, I mean, and 
she might have not have said it in the most political way, uh, you know, in the in the nicest uh, in the nicest terms possible. But Brie Larson had a point. Like I wasn't offended by it because I'm not a little baby. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but she she had a point. Like she, it would be nice to see uh, you know more people uh, of, of different backgrounds of different demographics mm-hmm. getting the kind of access. That she sees these people getting to be able to, you know, speak for different audiences when it comes to film criticism or film coverage. So, I mean, it's not that ridiculous of an idea. It's not sexist. It's not um, an attack on all men or whatever people felt like it was. It's just a reasonable point. And so what if she said it a little mean? (laughs) Like, who cares? Get over it. Yeah, that, yes. that I, I was. Uh, I had to like. I was like, kind of like, yes, preach. I feel you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I was letting that settle in, and I, I was, I was nodding, nodding, <laughs> shaking off. Yeah. It's, it's, it's insane. I'm. I want to say I'm kind of glad it's over, but I just feel like it's gonna happen again. I feel yeah. like it kind of goes to what you said. Is I. I don't want to be this person, but I bet you if a man said the same exact thing she said, if Sam Jackson said that on the press tour, we would not be having this conversation. Yeah. It would be a much different thing, and that's what's crazy. Um, I'm I'm curious if this is going to go forward. Again, I do want to see more people. I want to see 14-year-olds reviewing kids' movies. Why? Because it's made for them. I want yeah. their opinion, too. Like, I love different voices and different opinions. I want all of this. I don't think <laughs> movies are made just for one person, but when they're targeted at something let those people have a voice let's not talk over them yeah. let them have a chance i don't know it's a uh, i'm hoping this does gear criticism in a good way and i'm glad to hear there's people like gerald and alan who are the the target people that she was mentioning be like yeah she has a goddamn point yeah <laughs> and I mean, that's that's what we need I, I i mean even if like if she had her way exactly i would still be well represented yeah <laughs> in, in, in film yeah. criticism like it's Fine. I know the only way to fix this, guys. To use the internet, you have to confirm that you've had sex within the last year. If they <gasps> if they put that limit on the internet, goes away. Why We're do you want to, why do you want ban me from the internet? <laughs> Hang on, but, but uh, obviously you'd have to say without it being a film for child. Let, let's not put that on the whole <laughs> thing, shall we? Let's I just mean use of the internet in general. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, unless you're, you know, under a certain age, you know. <laughs> on a, on a more, Look, this isn't a perfect plan. <laughs> on, a more serious this note, is... on a more serious note, though, this, this kind of, it is like this whole, I don't know what you want to call it, issue moment that we're having with film criticism and representation it does kind of all boil down to two things number one is the lack of money in 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 magazine and website publication Mm -hmm. they you know people aren't being taken on there aren't these limitless opportunities for people to come and be film critics and write about films for publications and get paid a professional wage Mm -hmm. that's number one and then kind of a subsect of that would be that film critics don't ever seem to die like you don't retire <laughs> from being a critic. No, so you that's just, why there yeah. are so many old men because they started film criticism in the sixties, the seventies, and if they're still alive, they're still going. Yeah, oh, yeah Roger Ebert's out. ghost is still doing reviews. Oh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so that that ghost he thought this was is three out of four stars. <laughs> occupying, occupying, however many people's uh, positions on a, in a film criticism publication, <laughs> and then number two, you've got the internet where anyone can have an opinion and that it's, it's difficult to gauge which opinion you would like, which opinion might offend you. There are so many platforms. So you've got kind of this, this overwhelming mass wave of just loudness, <laughs> opinion yeah, with a capital yeah. O, just washing over everything. And they don't really go together very well. And then we're kind of in this mess in the middle. I'm not sure I articulated that very well. No, you did. The the internet has ruined everything, and I agree. I was about to say, as somebody who lives on the internet, it is a a cesspool. I've grown up with the internet. And the internet used to, like, be a bunch of people... It's always been a bunch of people raging at each other. But 
it didn't seem to spill out into other things. <laughs> it's like you said a bunch of mean things to people on forums and then you went about your day. But now it's just everywhere and it's permeated every aspect of life because the internet has permeated every aspect mm -hmm. of their life. No more comment sections. Comment sections are dead. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Nobody needs – it doesn't matter what you have to say. We wouldn't be in this current political good. climate without the internet. I'm just saying that right now. No, I agree with that. Mm. With, I mean, that sounds ridiculous, but I think it's 100% true. Anti vaxxers would have never caught on without the internet. Yeah, you wouldn't get these flat earthers. These weird, on without these the weird internet. people who, like, if they just lived, had to interact with people that they met on a regular basis, they wouldn't, you know, they just be like, yeah, I guess that one thing I thought was pretty dumb. And now they're like, hey, I think a dumb thing. Is there another 100,000 people that think the same <laughs> dumb thing? And then they find them, and then they just reinforce it for each other. And that's the world now. Yeah, yeah. And there's, and there's there's a real lack of accountability. Yes. You know, if it's your, you've got a username or you've got, as you said, how many thousand people you can find that agree with you, there's safety and protection and, in inverted commas, justification in numbers. And, yeah. yeah. That way, madness lies. Yeah. Well, thankfully, you can find all your great news on flickeringmyth.com <laughs> that is unbiased and has great, great feelings. And yeah, I don't know. I, exactly. I'm just, I, that's why I, one thing, you know, not to toot our own horn, but I do like that our website has different voices and mm -hmm. we do kind of allow, like, look at all four of us. We're all so vastly different, mm. but we can all come together. And I think that's, this kind of mentality and what I do notice on the site is what I want more. Like, I want all of us to just have more fun. I, I remember before I got even into comic book stuff, this was so easy to like movies. I come from horror movies. We like bad movies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now everything has to be good and pristine. It's just so weird. I just, I can't wait till the conversation becomes, hey, did you like that goofy, stupid movie? <gasps> I did too. Mm. And then it's done. Like, I, I would like to point out while we're, while we're talking about the site, just because this is the Flickering Myth podcast does not mean we are fully representative of the voices on that site. Oh, there are man. plenty of articles disagreeing with the shit that we say yeah, on yeah. the site. Do we need to make a disclaimer before every episode now? No. Do I not contain do the views and opinions. No, we. I mean, we we are part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, was saying, I almost gave that really bad Sharon Tate movie starring Hilary Duff a positive review, but I thought it would make our site look bad. So I <laughs> I decided not. <laughs> if it was a good movie, you give it a positive review. It doesn't oh, matter. Okay. There's the difference: is I laughed at it, and it's not a comedy. So I knew it stars like Hilary Duff and the guy from Mean Girls. It was great. I'm sold. I will say, yeah. Check out yeah. my review of that, where I go, "Wow, bad movies are fun. You should guys watch them." You need to send me that screener, bro. <laughs> I think everyone has bad films they love. I mean, I'm going to confess it publicly, quite loud and proud. I like Troy. <laughs> and that is a terrible, terrible film. And I even studied classics at university. So I know just how awful and how it shits all over everything. But I still enjoy its terribleness. It's fine. I like Alexander because it's super homoerotic. So <laughs> <laughs> I have just glided into this spot where, like, I don't even acknowledge that the things are widely considered bad anymore. I'm just like, yeah, yeah that's a great movie. Like, in my head, I'm just like... Yeah, you know, like probably in my top ten of, of films, like there's a lot of movies where people be like, that's a piece of shit. I'm like, I don't care. Not don't to like just her. go back to our yeah. other podcast, but like when we got around to watching a Jonah Hex for the Four Color Film Podcast, everybody's like, man, this movie's Jonah trash. Hex. But it's so fun. I love It's so dumb that. and yeah. fun. And I'm just like, yeah, this that's is a good time. Fun though, fun. That is the word. And that is, I think, something that not to kind of hark back to the whole critics thing, but like some people just need to chillax because <laughs> films are allowed to be fun. And actually, one of the things I would say about Captain Marvel, coming back around to that, uh, is it's a fun film. It's not perfect, but yeah. I thought it was fun and I was entertained. And surely those are quite important aspects of being a good, in inverted commas, film. Yeah, like, I feel like... And this is this sounds like a very main thing to say because I actually really like him as a filmmaker, but um, uh, Christopher Nolan ruined the uh, the popcorn film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> making it deep and meaningful. Yeah, like I mean, I do like uh, do like his Batman movies largely, but 
I feel like there's been some weird expectations since then that like everything has to say something and it just doesn't. Sometimes movies are stupid and sometimes they're fun and they're still good for it. If you enjoyed yeah. a movie, it was a good movie. Yeah. There's no like, there's no criteria that it has to reach or no like deep philosophical meaning that it has to convey. Sometimes you just like that they put Gatlin guns on a horse. <laughs> <laughs> So, like what you like, America. That's all we're saying. And the world. And, and at UK. large. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all of Europe, all of Asia. All the world, just out. Come on. international. Sorry, I, I keep forgetting how international we are sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> we're Stop a being such a globalist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I feel like that sums up everything I've had to say about movies. <laughs> well that concludes this yeah, podcast so forever positive i really like this whole end vibe we're just like yeah we're all hippies now <laughs> <laughs> we're movie hippies I, I just feel like we we, we fixed film criticism guys job, yeah. job done it's it's you great because last week we fixed racism with the help <laughs> of green book and this week we fixed the internet and film criticism so we're on a roll this is a uh this what is next? a cultural cornerstone of a podcast. I'm going for hunger next week. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> I'm spent. So unless any of you guys have anything else to say. No, nope. no I don't want to spoil it. No. All right. Yeah. We're just going to go out on this high note. <laughs> yeah. We got to figure out how to fix everything. I'm going to fix the gay agenda next week. Yes. We're there. Um, so there is an agenda. Oh, yeah. It's it get does. more people to watch Love, Simon, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> horrible movie. I thought it was to fix outfits because, honestly, I could use some help with my wardrobe. No, I don't That's know. I dress horrible on purpose. Let's, let's just... <laughs> You're ruining it. You're ruining it. <laughs> we were having a great time. <laughs> Peace, happiness, world hunger. You can find Wait, us on all your bad. favorite podcatchers and at flickeringmyth.com as part of the Flickering Myth Podcast Network. Uh, you can always email us podcast at flickeringmyth.com. Guys, it's been a great week. Thank you for coming on and doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Alan Christian. I'm Gerald James. I'm Tori Brazier. And I'm the critic that Brie Larson doesn't hate, EJ. <laughs> yeah, because you not hate me either. <laughs> yeah, she would just really hate us. Thankfully for her, I yeah, only but... review really <laughs> shitty movies <laughs> that, that happen to pique my interest when they come across on the screeners. Guys, we'll see you next Tuesday. Good night.